you, me, webinar. This is how it works. Uh, today, we also have one very happy addition, which is the rather excellent Russell Parsons, uh, the newly promoted editor in chief of uh, Marketing Week, which is uh, absolutely brilliant to have him here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Marketing Week was founded in 1978 uh, with the first issue going out on the 10th of March uh, of that year with a magazine priced at 40p. Uh, today, the publication regularly features the likes of Mark Ritson, Tish Fish, Tim Fishbourne, uh, Helen Edwards, and uh, many more, plus uh, news, insights, uh, loads and loads of stuff. Uh, Marketing Week has gone on to become one of the most important sources of information, inspiration, and educators for marketers across the land. Um, I was just speaking with Russell just before we got going, and, and uh, he said he didn't know whether to be happy uh, for us or, or, or what with the Marketing Week growing as it is. But um, honestly, I, I see the Marketing Week as just the source of inspiration and, and, and just uh, inspiration in its purest form. So um, no, no pressure there. Uh, in 2014, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, in 2014, Russell uh, became the seventh editor, having worked his way up from being a reporter starting in 2009. Uh, Russell took over the ship in a time of real change uh, in the journal journalism sector with the digitalization of how we engage with content, meaning big changes in business models. Uh, one example is in 2019, Marketing Week, uh, Marketing Week announced a subscription service. Uh, only a few weeks ago, Russell was announced as editor-in-chief of Marketing Week and the Festival of Marketing. I'll be asking more about that later. Uh, one caveat Russell gave at his talk at the London event, which he was kind enough to speak at too, is that he doesn't claim to be a marketer, and this is important. On a personal level, uh, a measure of Russell as a person can be found in an article uh, I found a little bit earlier, where he's asked the best piece of advice he's, he's received. Simply, his response was, be kind, it's nice to be nice, which I think is uh, really nice. Uh, <laughs> I can say that this holds true on a personal level with my experience of the man. Uh, I first met Russell through my involvement with the School of Marketing. Here, Russell was integral in a movement to bring through the next generation of marketers into our industry. Uh, by opening their eyes to the possibilities that our profession holds. Uh, this wasn't something he had to do, but it's something he threw the weight of Marketing Week behind uh, because it's important, which I think is a, a real measure of the man. Outside of work, Russell is a proud father and a pop music fan. Uh, and we will be coming back to the second of those things in a moment too. Um, I just wanna say thanks to Russell for being here. Uh, not only is he a huge influence on our industry, uh, but he's impacted me professionally through his work and his actions. So I'm grateful for him and I'm grateful for everyone who's tuned in today for the webinar. Um, this session is running as a pure Q&A. That means that now is the time to get your questions in. As ever, if you wiggle your mouse uh, in, in the Zoom feature, you'll be able to see down the bottom, there's uh, the Q&A feature. Get your questions in now, because uh, I'll be starting out with some, but I'd love to hear yours too. Uh, and, and Russell, I, I asked him yesterday if anything's off the cards and he said that he's happy to, to take questions. He's an open book, uh, pardon the pun. Um, finally, before we get going, I just want to thank the sponsors. Uh, all of them have been absolutely unbelievable. Um, I know that I banged on about this and I think this is like the 11th or the 12th week, but they didn't have to stand by us when COVID hit, when the model changed, when the industry got shoved on its head but they stood by us, they stood by our community, they stood by me, they stood by the marketing meetup. I'm grateful for them and uh, hopefully you are too because we wouldn't be set here today if it wasn't for, for them supporting us. So I won't go into loads of depth on them here because you've got them in the email you got this morning about the event and you'll hear about them in the follow-up email, but thank you to Pitch, Content Cal, Fiverr, Redgate, Cambridge Martin College, Lidu, Brand, Further, Third Light, Bravo and Human. Um, one ask is that, as ever, I will include a LinkedIn profile for an individual within these companies. Just take the time to thank them. They're all human beings. They like to be appreciated, which is fair enough. So uh, let's make sure that uh, they get the props they deserve. So with all that said, uh, I can introduce the man of the hour and, and sort of say, welcome, Russell. Thank you for spending some time with us. 
Uh, good evening, Joe, and bless you all uh, who have uh, <laughs> taken time out after your busy working days uh, to, to listen. I do wonder, Joe, in your introduction when you said, for those of you that don't know, if anybody doesn't know at the very least what Marketing Week is, uh, then I do wonder why the hell they're uh, listening. <laughs> <in there. laughs> it's, my, it's a very fair my, point. My, my sunny disposition and uh, and um, and kind face that they were. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's the money maker. I reckon that's why people are here. Uh, to be honest, I should move my uh, my camera onto the screen. To be honest, so uh, we can actually engage in, in straightforward conversation rather than me looking like I'm looking away. So uh, this is a Q and A, Russell. And uh, to match your sunny disposition, I wanted to start off with uh, something to warm you up um, because I know you're a pop fan, and uh, so. I thought I'd start off with a few trivia questions. Um, and oh, oh my God. See, <laughs> we'll see how we go. So <laughs> it's only, only, <laughs> only three questions. So uh, number one, uh, what year was Live Aid? Uh, that's, that's an easy one. That's uh, 1985. Smashed it. Nice. Um, okay, number two. I don't, I'd never heard of this, so uh, we'll see how this one goes. Uh, who sang the 1984 hit All Cried Out? That was uh, Alison Moye, the second solo single of the album <laughs> Alf. I believe it was the top 10 hit. No, I'm not <laughs> That's ridiculous. I could have gone there, but that would just, I mean, I'm already being backed into pretty a geek corner. <laughs> and and, and uh, finally, uh, who was, this is an easy one, I think, uh, who was Christmas number one in 1988 with Mistletoe and Wine? Oh, of course, sir. Uh, um, if he isn't knighted, then he should be. Uh, Cliff Richard. Oh, one. Three to three. What a man. If you weren't already impressed, then uh, you should be now. <laughs> so, and the for parties. Yeah. <laughs> you must have been doing well, actually, in, in the lockdown quizzes. Um, I haven't actually taken part in any lockdown quizzes. I've, I've been quiz master with some friends of mine. Nice. Um, old friends who are as uh, wizened and bald as I am um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we quiz every Sunday night so and I'm the one doing the quiz nice okay I think everyone needs that everyone needs that role um, my brother is the person in my family who uh, despite being the younger one sort of maintains that air of authority in, in our family so uh, he uh, kind of takes takes the the, re the reins on that kind of stuff um, I can see some questions coming in already and what I should say is that if people, uh, if you see the, a question that you want answering, uh, use the thumbs up feature because we'll we'll answer the questions from the top. Um, but if we start out with a, a few of my own and, and then we'll start taking them from the community as well. So um, you've got your new role, Russell, which yeah. is amazing. So like, what does it mean? <laughs> Editor in chief of Marketing Week and, and, and the Marketing Week Live or the Festival of Marketing. Uh, yeah. What does it mean? I requested the uh, the grandest uh, uh, title uh, that I possibly <laughs> get. Um, in itself, it has no meaning or additional responsibilities. It just makes me sound way cleverer than I actually am. <laughs> no, I, I, I jest. Um, I, I, editor in, edit, uh, having said that, Editor-in-Chief is one of those things that can mean lots of things to different people, uh, depending on where you work. I, 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 in, in my case, I suppose what it means is that I continue to have overall responsibility for the content uh, direction of marketing week uh, mm -hmm. i also add to that the festival of marketing for anybody who doesn't know this is not going to be a hard sell the festival of marketing is a an annual festival of marketing uh, part conference part celebration of strategic effectiveness that takes place uh, every year in october in tobacco dock in london Clearly, given circumstances, we're looking very hard, shall we say. I can't reveal anything uh, in detail at the moment, but we're looking and thinking very hard about what we do this year. Uh, but uh, no, so, I mean, it, it's a very different challenge uh, in terms of execution and delivery, but at the heart of it, it's what do marketers need to know more about and how can we best deliver that in conference form? So that's my job now and will continue to be my job uh, leading up to whatever it looks like in October and beyond as well. Nice, cool. And and on that, you, you said 
uh, what do marketers need to know about? And, and this is a broader question on, you know, how you go about deciding, you no doubt get hundreds of bits of information thrown at you every day. How do you decide what does go into marketing week and, and what doesn't? Um, that's a really good question. I think if I strip it back to, we are about marketing for marketers, uh, which might sound like a screamingly and stupid thing to say, but uh, it, it, is, it is actually a, uh, a focus that we have in the UK, at least, that nobody else shares. Our competitors, if you like, are a couple of things to a couple of different communities. So every piece of content that we uh, deliver to people whether or not it be through an event or through a feature or a podcast or whatever it is, it has to be about marketing and it has to appeal to marketers. Mm -hmm. We also have to, well, I'll give it, I'll use a lofty word of purpose. We're here to, uh, as they, uh, the classic role of a trade magazine is we're here to celebrate what good looks like and the people doing good things, but we're also here to question and we're also here to hold the industry community to account if they are demonstrating bad practice so that's with those two things in mind what qualifies for good content mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously you get down to the more uh, the nitty and the gritty of it so you you start to look at what the uh, objectives uh, and what the fundamentals of marketing are and how can we tick those boxes and how can we illuminate and offer insight against those as well. So that's a lot of questions to be asking when you get a press release forward. But mm -hmm. essentially, you've got to know your audience and to know your audience, you've got to know what they're interested in and uh, to be able to move uh, the industry forward and indeed help and improve and add value to people's lives, then you've got to do some of those things you've got to cover the things that matter to them in their job but also make sure that you are as i say on one hand celebrating what good luck looks like and on the other holding the industry to account for mm -hmm. what uh, isn't so good mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's i mean that's a long way round of saying um uh, what what well, answering your question but uh, you've got to ask those questions otherwise what's the point yeah, you got to ask yourself, what value am I adding if I do this thing? Yeah, when it comes to gauging this demand, um, does do does the direction that you take? It's a bit a little bit chicken and egg. It feels like. Do you do you look at the things that seem to be working and and do more of that kind of article, or do you take more of a leadership position when deciding your editorial direction? You know, and saying this is where the industry needs to go, or this seems to be what's resonating. Yeah, I think it is a little bit of both. Um, one of the the downsides, shall we say, the blight of the modern digital era is that uh, news outlets uh, tended to rush towards what was popular. Um, and I think and you mentioned in your introduction that I uh, became editor or certainly news editor uh, uh, during the digital revolution of publishing, where we started to move away from magazines and uh, the commercial advertising revenue generated through magazines and online. And we thought for a while that big numbers meant success. Mm -hmm. um, but then you sort of take a step back and think, actually, we're, 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 we're serving a finite audience. We're not, uh, we're not the Daily Mail. We're not mm -hmm. Um, BuzzFeed, we don't have to generate massive numbers. What we do need to generate is impact. We need to, uh, in some way, shape or form, add that value to enable somebody to think differently or do their job better, or by holding them to account, um, as I said earlier. So it's not a numbers game. So then it becomes more about, okay, so what matters? What will make a difference? And it then doesn't become a job of uh, page views and success is not judged by volume. It's judged by impact and influence. So are you influential in your industry? And of course, there's lots of different ways that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Are you impactful in your industry? Uh, do you matter in your industry? And I'm not saying that we have that licked in any way, shape or form, but that's the objective. Yeah. That's really interesting. And 
how does that conversation go with you know the, the holding group so to speak so you know you've got a, a larger entity that sort of sits above a number of publications do they sort of feel very comfortable that impact metrics are going to be the thing that you know drives the business or is it i mean truthfully i guess it'll be down to it, yes uh, in short um, mm -hmm. although it's not quite as easy as that because i can't um i can't justify investment in resources just by saying oh, but look at us we're influential um however influence and impact um comes down to a quite a simple uh, metric um, are people signing up to pay for an event are they signing up to pay for a subscription mm -hmm. now if they're not nobody's going to transact with you yeah. um, because they like uh trivia yeah what they're going to do is pay for you because you are adding value in their lives in their professional lives um, and that's the best barometer of success for us at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a premium product by virtue of the fact that we're asking people to pay for something that they've been used to getting for nothing for years. Sure. Now, we invest a hell of a lot of time and effort, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the audience. So we must be doing something right if people are paying for the trouble of reading everything that we're producing. And that has to be the the justification, but also the proof that we're having some impact and we are influential in some way. Definitely. No, that, that makes perfect sense. And that's that's been a huge change, you know, and on a broader scale, you saw that probably the Times were one of the people that sort of pioneered, you know, putting content behind a, a paywall and, and stuff like that. How what have your learnings been over the past year or so? So I think you launched, was it June-ish last year? Uh, it was July, just just July. under a year ago now. Yeah. Um, what my learnings are that I shouldn't be anywhere near as anxious about it uh, as I was. I think the, uh, the night before, without wanting to let light in on the magic or the darkness of my soul, which I've always wanted. <laughs> I was more nervous than I've ever been in my professional life because uh, suddenly you wake up in the morning and you're putting a value on what you do. Therefore, you are judging yourself in, in many different ways as to how good you are at your job. Yeah. So if you're saying uh, you can read this, but it will cost you, and we're in, you're asking people to engage with you on that transactional level, then they are making that judgment that it's worth paying for. Um, so I was really nervous about it, but it turns out that uh, that people are willing to pay for it. So that's edification. Yeah. That's a kind of metaphorical uh, pat on the back, but it just proves to you that if you do something and you offer something of value, mm -hmm. then people will transact with you and people will pay for it. Um, of course, you have to therefore double down on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and be very, very focused, uh, to mm -hmm. answer your point belatedly on what's changed. You have to be very focused on what you do and why you do it, and to make sure that you are adding that value to people's lives, um, because you want more people to sign up and you want to keep the people already signed up uh, transacting with you after the first year as well um, so it's it does change the game uh, totally um, but it actually makes you better at what you do because you've got to make sure that what you're offering is of premium value absolutely i think a lot of people like not just in you know the content generation sets that can take an awful lot from that i think there's probably uh, quite a lot of people and i'd count myself within this bracket you know, who see, see so much content and uh, even work being given away for free, um, mm -hmm. that put in a value next to something and saying, you know what, I've got the confidence to stand behind this and say, this is worth it. Um, it's a nerve wracking thing to do, but that's quite, you know, it's a really nice story to hear from someone such as yourself, who obviously is so respected in the industry to sort of say, A, you are nervous about it, but B, you kind of got through that and, and, and it worked out well, you know, so that, that feels like a really nice message, I think. Well, I found loads of other things to be anxious and nervous about. In the <laughs> but, uh, on that particular, you know, now I'm, I'm through that now. 
Uh, I mean, you know, I'm talking and to your point earlier, I'm not a marketer uh, and everybody listening probably is, I'm assuming, in marketing. Um, So it is a classic case of making sure that you have a proposition uh, and and it really does mean that you've got to be on your metal here. You've got to have a very clear proposition. You've got to have a purpose and an objective. What are you actually trying to achieve? What's what's in it for the person who is uh, paying for the trouble of reading everything that you do? And, um, and you've got to make sure that that premium value that you are attributed to it is uh, both maintained through what you do and the proposition that you offer and the content that you deliver. It, it's, it is a classic case of, uh, of marketing um, and it makes your job as editor way more different than it was uh, before because you can be a you know, it, it's a balance now of being that kind of romantic sense and notion of an editor, truth sayer, um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, deliver of exclusives and 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 uh, scoops and all of that is still relevant. But you've got to make sure that what you're doing isn't just competing with the guys down the road for an exclusive, uh, but you're actually offering something that um, will make a difference to people's lives, professional lives. That is. No, that makes real sense. So um, I've got a couple more questions and then we'll start taking them uh, from the community. There's already 31 lined up, so uh, people are ready and raring to go. Yeah. I want to focus on PR because it's something that I just don't understand. And <laughs> honestly, like it is an absolute mystery to me. Um, and the reason for that is that I've sat through a lot of talks about, my, uh, about PR and the takeaway from every single one of them, I think, has always been get to know a journalist and then send them stuff. And like that seems to be the long and short of it. You know, interact with them on Twitter and, and like their comments. And then, you know, you just get to know them. Eventually, you'll drop them an email sort of saying, hey, I did this thing. So, uh, so you know, what do you think? Is that how, you know, you operate? And I guess a more direct question is, do press releases work in 2020? Is that still still a thing? Um, I don't know if I can be so blanket as to say they do or they don't, uh, but to answer your first question, which might in itself reveal an answer of sorts to the second, mm-hmm. uh, a good PR uh, is one that understands their client or the company that they work for, but more importantly, understands at the journalist that they are looking to pitch that story to. Mm-hmm. Now that might seem like a really basic one on one in PR, but it works. So anybody who comes to me uh, with a pitch that feels totally impersonal, totally ill thought out, mm-hmm. uh, is, is not gonna get my notice, mainly because I've got way too many other things to do and I receive literally hundreds of these things but if somebody has taken the trouble to understand the the publication that they're pitching to Mm -hmm. not necessarily the person because it might get a bit creepy if they've followed you on social media and start referring uh, to things that you've done back to you and that has happened although I'm particularly active on social media people have said oh I see you like this or do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway uh moving on but if they understand uh they understand what you're trying to do i talk about purpose and proposition no you know unless i've given them a little speech uh, that you've heard in miniature this evening then they're not going to understand that but if they know their job and they know their brief and they know the title that they're pitching to then they're going to have a pretty good idea what you're trying to do mm-hmm. and if they relay that understanding back to you and give you an angle that will allow you to achieve what you're trying to achieve then they're obviously well on the way of getting in through the door now of course it also helps if you know this person as well and it's an old school pr art of getting to know journalists you know the days of long lunches and and uh, expense accounts perhaps sadly uh, are, are no longer or at least are not to the same extent that they were uh, but at the very least, um, if you know somebody and you know what they're interested in or their audience is interested in, then that's going to get you through the door. Um, and, and that'll also make any email with any pitch more noticeable and uh, more resonant as well. 
for sure so uh, you know I, I heard you say at the beginning that you know you've you've kind of got three areas which you look at you've got what does good look like uh, question or call out the industry if we're doing bad and 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 finally sort of look at the nitty and gritty of marketing if someone was to come to you with a pitch and sort of say it's within these brackets is that sort of the best way to start the conversation so far as you're concerned for marketing week well if anybody listening this evening who happens to work in pr who relays that exact uh, quote back to me then that's <laughs> all under the uh, <laughs> the creepiness sounding <laughs> <laughs> creep but, um, no i mean maybe i mean no, don't just say it demonstrate it um uh, you know if uh, if you've got if a pr has a pitch which um you know it's a company that's doing something different and that's uh, innovative in the context of that company and that category and would say to me actually uh this will help uh, your audience in various different vertical sectors learn something about what good looks like, then that's perfect because that's actually in effect writing or, or well on the way of writing the story uh, for you or at least um, offering you a starting point. So yeah, of course, if somebody talked to me in that way, yeah. then they could get a way better hearing than um, uh, this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, give me a shout if you want to write about it. Well, right. I don't know why I should be interested unless it's self-evident or absolutely apparent why this is interesting. It's about context as well. Uh, the best, one of the best pieces of advice that a former editor ever gave me is that nothing happens in a vacuum. So uh, what I took from that is that this is interesting because in the context of this category or sector or time or circumstance, then this is different. Yeah course anything that's different is interesting um, and anything that is interesting is a value potential value to the audience so no, that makes sense okay fab right we'll move on to uh some communities from from folks uh who have submitted them and i'm literally going to be taking them from the top so as i say um if you have a question there's 34 open ones um if the people watching, the lovely people watching could do me a favor. And if you see a question you want answering, just give it a thumbs up because uh, that's how we're gonna be taking these, um, these questions. Uh, so the first is from, from Jack, uh, Jack Cooper, who says, having worked both in-house and in agencies, uh, he feels in-house marketing teams are often underrepresented, uh, um, underrepresented in the industry. Uh, oh. What advice would you give to in-house teams on getting noticed more for the excellent work that they're doing? Or uh, another way of putting it, how do they stand out slash gain features in publications such as Marketing Week? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I, uh, I, I don't know whether or not accepting the premise is the right way of putting it, but uh, I think probably Jack is talking about uh, maybe celebration of uh, of agencies um, and i'm not sure whether or not that comes from the fact that agencies particularly creative agencies do things that everybody can see uh, that are apparent to my mum as much as anybody else in the industry so perhaps by virtue of that then they are celebrated whereas marketing teams do actually the stuff of a men's value whether or not that be uh, CRM or loyalty programs or targeting and segmentation which isn't quite as sexy as apparent to the person down the road but is of immense value. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure how I what advice I can give them to to make sure that, that their fine work is better celebrated um, other than perhaps thinking about some of the things I just said to you. I mean I'm I, I'm interested whether or not a company, sorry, a, a, a brand is small, medium or large, uh, has a big or small marketing team. If there's a story that uh, transcends uh, that uh, company, i.e. there's something that you've done uh, differently, particularly right now, I'm all really interested in people doing acting and behaving in a different manner to cope with these colossal mindfuck of a situation that we're in at the moment then uh please let me know and i guess that will help you in your celebration um 
I mean, all you got to do, Jack, is just uh, explain to me, as I said to uh, to you a moment ago, Jack, why this is interesting, why this is of value, why this would matter to more than you and your team, yeah. and maybe there's an opportunity there. I yeah. feel like I fudged the answer there, Jack. I apologize. <laughs> well, no, you know, I, I think there's an answer in there somewhere. I'm just not sure it was to the question you were actually asking. I, I think the answer right there is, and and I, I often find this, is that we had a, a, a webinar the other day with um, the former CFO of Publicis. And like, for me, I'd overblown the role of finance and marketing far more than it needed to be in my head. And actually what you've done, and the solution that uh, she gave me over the course of the call were the most simple things. Uh, it was stuff like, you know, speak to the finance team and and you've done exactly the same here which is uh find me an angle which is interested of people beyond just just my team you know and and for me that's that's quite a simple answer but also something that feels quite accurate so um good thank you (laughs) (laughs) so um we've got a question from baz and and i'm sure this is uh something that quite a lot of people are interested in um which is how much effing and jeffing do you need to edit out of Mark Ritson's <laughs> articles? Um, and do you need to uh, tame the beast, <laughs> so to speak? Um, okay. I'm well, just reading that out. So I'm going to interpret the question um, uh, in my own way. But it's, a, it's a, actually on the, on the swearing, it's really interesting. Um, I was looking back. Uh, it's Mark's 10th anniversary with us uh, this year, um, more of which later in the year. Um, and I uh, was looking back at some of the old articles that he did for us. And um, uh, in many ways, I wouldn't say they were tamer. They were no more, no less direct and, and cogent and salient uh, in the points that they were making, but they weren't anywhere near as colourful. Mm. I'll use that word loosely, colourful in their language uh, and their prose. Now, I I put that down to a couple of things, mainly by uh, because Mark used to write in the first instance for us for a print magazine, uh, which uh, so we he used to fly on the Tuesday. We went to press on the Tuesday. We would have a fresh new article. Uh, as contemporaneous as we possibly can about an issue of that week. Um, But he had to write to 800 words. So um, A, there's there's almost less room, less permission to be sweary in print. And B, you've only got 800 words. So you can't be as flowery um, and as explorative in your prose. Now, that changed uh, a when we went monthly uh, which was probably about three years ago now so we were picking a mark article from the month that just felt as relevant and as timely and as in line with the rest of the magazine as possible but also uh we he got licensed to write more words and to go in more places uh, if you like online and he did um and uh, I don't know why, but it feels like swearing online is people give you more permission and license to do it. I don't know why. Um, so it wasn't ever a conscious decision that I decided, you know what, let, let him get away with it. Let him swear. Um, I just started to omit less uh, swearing in his copy. Right. And as for Taming the Beast, the thing is about Mark, as I'm sure, well, let me know if you don't agree, but most of you probably will agree. He's a genius. Yeah. And uh, I think you've got to just appreciate the value of having him on your team. And that's the great and wonderful thing about Mark. He is a team member. He is a team player. He might feel a bit or sound a bit out there on occasion, but he's, he's supportive and he's loyal and he really understands and appreciates the value of uh, who he's writing for in the marketing week, uh, but also um, in the audience that he's writing for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you allow him not, it's not allowing him, it's not about allowing him to get away with things, but it's like, if you've got somebody that talented, why wouldn't you let them express themselves? Mm-hmm. So I don't tame him in, in, 
in uh, in the sense that I would ever curb what he wrote about. But of course, when you are asked, when you have somebody who's willing to say what many are not, mm -hmm. and who is opinionated, it's wonderful. That, you know, fancy that an opinion writer who has an opinion. Then there are occasions where you have to just balance uh, what you're including of his copy, make sure it's factually tight and um and is fit for publication but that's just the job of editing yeah. so i don't tame him in the sense that i don't keep a i don't need to keep a rein in fact i would like to i would like him to go where he wants to go because he's shown me time and time again wherever that place is mm -hmm. it's of immense i keep using this word value to the audience so mm -hmm. it's not a problem in any way shape or form we get complaints some of his language does offend yeah. um, but I and I and I take those complaints seriously um, because anybody who's taking issue uh, with any of it it's their opinion and of course that is of immense value because it's the way that they feel mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time um, I take a, a view that most people will be very aware and very expectant of what you're entering into when you begin to read a moderate article sure I, th I think some people over the course of time and, and as you say 10 years you build that permission because you proved it you know and, and yeah 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 is it is you know what is there's, there's no need to rein him in there's no need to tame him uh, it's an absolute pleasure to work with him um and i i say that unreservedly <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll send him the video later so uh yeah. <laughs> so we've got uh, the question from kirsten actually leads on from this nicely um who says that other than mark um what marketing influencers do you recommend follow learn more from or uh, or companies as well so where do you look for your inspiration outside of mark um individuals and companies wise uh, I mean, that's a good question. There's a guy called uh, Bob Hoffman who uh, writes under the name of the ad contrarian in the US mainly, who I'm a big admirer of. In many ways, he's a bit like Mark um, in the sense that he, I suppose a casual observer might call him a contrarian, um, but uh, he, well, <laughs> I just said that without uh, calling back to his actual uh, moniker of ad contrarian. But... <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, okay. I'll take it's some. I'll, it's, I'll, I'll yeah. on it. it's funny, the ad contrarian is a contrarian and he's very good at being contrary. <laughs> so I would recommend him. Um, I'm very, uh, there's two people who we have a close relationship with it. Um, firstly, Helen Edwards, uh, who is a columnist of mine and has been for about two and a half years now. Uh, very different to Mark in style, but no less impactful. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed influential in her own way. Um, I, I wouldn't, this is not supposed to be damning uh, praise or faint praise, but she's very scholarly. She's very uh, deliberate, uh, mm -hmm. but no less insightful. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and she's brilliant. Uh, Tom Fishburne, who uh, is the marketoonist, who we've had a very close relationship for, with for years, who is the world's loveliest man, uh, is also very, very different, clearly, his execution is cartoon, but no less uh, hard hitting in many ways. Um, and uh, he's, he, you know, he, he's there in the same way as Mark uh, is to puncture, receive wisdom and to cut through group thinking because a lot of that is very pervasive. There's a very pervasive culture of group thinking in marketing. So it's brilliant to work with both Tom and Mark who are very good at cutting through that. Mm. Um, but there is, um, I mean, there's just, just some wonderful people out there who are super clever. I mean, one of the most wonderful things about being an editor of Marketing Week is how many people out there are just supremely clever. You know, I mean, all of how clever people are. Uh, so whether or not it's people like uh, Binet and Field, who do a lot of research and report writing about advertising effectiveness, uh, but are also great opinion writers. Uh, I, I know he's a bit of a, uh, a divisive figure in many ways, but Byron Sharp is such a supremely clever bloke. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read anything that he writes, you might not agree with him, but he um, he he writes in such a wonderful way. Uh, Dave Trott, who uh, has written a column for Campaign for many years, just has a wonderful way with words and a brilliant, very punctuated style as well. So I would highly 
highly recommend uh, uh, him and uh, and those people, but mainly the people who write for Marketing Week. <laughs> Shoot, you don't need to go any further. Naturally, yeah, naturally. <laughs> I love that. And and um, you know, we, we started this conversation by saying you're not a marketer, but you do spend a lot of time interacting with marketers. Um, by the way, there's a couple of comments coming in uh, from folks who miss those names. Um, what we'll do is we will um, in the write-up of this we'll, we'll write it as a list so you'll have those people so yeah um, so um don't worry about that um so the beginning of this question was that you spend a lot of time with these people but you're not a marketer yourself what are some of like i don't know the top couple of lessons that you as a journalist and now an editor have taken into your own world and kind of said you know what that makes sense even though it started as a marketing lesson it's now, uh, you know, it's changed how I work as a journalist. Um, yeah. Um, the- well, if I correct myself a little bit, um, I do tend to find myself approaching most challenges uh, with a marketing hat on, or at least my mm-hmm. uh, meagre understanding of what, um, uh, uh, how a marketing plan comes together. Yeah. Um, I alluded to uh, the fact that I have to think differently about what we do, what our proposition is, what our purpose is, what our points of difference are, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what our positioning should be in order to be be more salient, uh, have more impact, uh, be of more value. I mean, all of those things are, and all of those words are what everybody here would recognize. I'm not saying I'm particularly good at it, but it (laughs) definitely influences the way I approach innovation so you know as i said to you a moment ago we're thinking about the festival and we're thinking about what that looks like and why it's there and why anybody would give a damn Mm -hmm. Um, and you've got to start to think about it in terms of as a as a marketing uh, challenge Mm. so as i say i'm not saying i'm a practitioner and i would be totally lost if you put me in the middle of a marketing team and asked me to be a part of it and offer some value but you think about uh, what you do it isn't just about the uh, the output it's not just about the story at the end of the day we're journalists we can back ourselves to tell a good story and to put it into context and make sure that it's not only well read but it's of interest but everything that goes into that before that is as much as anything a, 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 the, the same process as I understand it that a marketer would go through as well Absolutely. And, and I think it was Rory Sutherland who said something like, you know, if you're going to define marketing, it's the lens of the customer um, in an yeah. organization. And that's, like- that, that's interesting. I mean, that's the, that's the thing that journalists uh, historically, um, as a writer, as a reporter, you're there uh, to chase a story down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what you're not necessarily there always to do is to work out whether or not that story is worth telling in the first place. Right. And one thing that I've realized and I'm still learning about is as an editor, um, as I say, the story, uh, the way that you write a story, the way the way you report a story, the way you prepare to be the best reporter, that hasn't changed. But as an editor, you have to think about the customer. Um, you have to realize, and that's why I kind of say in that horrible old cliche about being the voice of the customer, but also realizing, as I think Mark is fond of saying, that you're not the customer as well. So yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, that allows you to have an overview of an industry, but it also helps you better prepare to understand them as well at the same time. 100%. So true. I, I don't know where the time is going, um, but like we... we Sorry. Said- do like no it, it's not a thing to apologize for this is it's been great so far but i'm, I'm conscious that like we said we keep to an hour so we've got a bunch of questions uh so i'm gonna try and suggest that we get through as many as possible uh quite quickly um as i say folks use the thumbs up functionality um because that's how we're going to be taking them from the top um so uh we've got a question from the mysterious anonymous um who who uh, has come in who says uh, I want to use this time to learn some new skills. If you're about to hire for a marketing position, uh, what are the three most important areas of knowledge and skill that you would look for? Um, I'd probably add here that like, 
your role isn't necessarily expecting to be uh, hiring into uh, marketing teams and stuff like that, although you've no doubt a, a hand in that in some capacity. So I guess I might broaden that out to sort of say, what trends are you seeing in the marketing industry that you think may also be able to be converted for people's day-to-day skill set um, on a very sort of broad, broad level? Oh, goodness. Uh, I think I probably will have to keep it a very broad level. So is the question what anybody wanting to get into marketing might need to know more about before they apply for jobs? Yeah, so the three most areas of knowledge. Okay. Um, Well, this is all secondhand. This is all observed. That's too big caveats that I need to explain before anybody takes any notice of my advice before they (laughs) rock up for an interview or a a Zoom call for a job. Um, But I I would say um, you need to, I mean, it's like anything. I mean, I I was a qualified journalist for whatever that meant, but it meant that I, so whatever that means now, but what it meant is that I understood the tenets of uh, marketing sorry journalism um, so I, I I'm a big uh, proponent of people who uh, learn their craft and uh, and and train in what they do I know that's very much a mantra of, uh, of Marx but I 100% agree with him thinking about my own experience I came to journalism quite late um, I felt like I had a lot of catching up to do and the best way to do that was not just to play around for a while uh, and be curious about uh, the life and world, but actually to have some training and qualification in doing it. So I think I would advise anybody to do that. Um, the other thing is, uh, don't think of marketing as a separate, isolated function. Um, it's less a trend, more of a of a hope, an aspiration for marketing. Is that it's it's a, it's a it's a function that ha- at its heart offers business solutions. Uh, to business problems uh, as opposed to just being an executor of somebody else's strategy within the business so if you're starting a career or you're in the middle of your career then uh, think about where marketing fits in the organization how you engage with other stakeholders how you help the business achieve what it needs to achieve or the organization achieve what it needs to achieve um so think about it in the round uh, otherwise you will stay a specialist in your area and not necessarily progress through the ranks and become a valuable and influential and impactful member of the business yeah wicked um so anyway that's just a couple of things i'm sure there's many more but i'm conscious of time no no not at all that was really useful um We've got uh, questions here from Selena and Nisha, um, but both are more sort of tactically uh, marketing driven. And I appreciate that's not really your area of specialism. So what I'm going to suggest uh, to these lovely human beings is that um, potentially we, we crowdsource these as, as questions for uh, the community on large um, and, and then sort of move further down the list um, because they're very valid questions in themselves, but uh, I don't think this is necessarily uh, the right webinar to answer them. Um, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so um, the, the third question is from uh, Michael here, who says, uh, what would you say has been uh, the most valuable change in the marketing arena in the past 12 months? And what do you see the biggest challenges and opportunities that face the industry in the next 12? Oh, crumbs. Um, <laughs> it's big. I, uh, well, I'm not sure that life and life in marketing changes changes so much year to year. Um, one thing I have noticed, and I hope it is a not curtailed by the current uh, current environment and the crisis that we're all still in the middle of and are yet to see the economic effects of uh, in full. But we started, I believe anyway, to uh, move away from a focus on uh, the efficiency of marketing spend and uh, back towards the effectiveness of what you did. So I think when I uh, joined Marketing Week just after the financial crash, uh, they, and I've charted the impact of that over the years that followed it, people started to uh, 
get lost in spreadsheets and to start talking about the impact of what they did in regards to the cost efficiency of, uh, of what they did. Um, so it was all very data driven. It was all very micro targeted. It was all very much to demonstrate to your boss that you could do something at scale at lower cost, which in theory is brilliant, but in practice, this money was getting lost, uh, you know, kind of data driven, digital dead end in many cases. Um, and I think because of the fine work of people like Lesbian A and Peter Field and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work and the words of people like Mark in particular, that people are waking up to the value of effectiveness. So it's about responsible return. It's about profitability. It isn't necessarily about three pounds for every pound that you invest. It's about looking at what your strategic objective is and measuring success based upon what you're actually trying to do strategically and as a business, as opposed to just looking at the cost efficiency of what you spend. So the move from efficiency to effectiveness, which isn't necessarily something that was happening in 12 months previous, but has been sort of moving in that direction for maybe the last couple of years, I think is a really positive thing that I want to see continue. Uh, as for the next 12 months, well, most of it is gonna be colored by uh, the situation as it is at the moment. And I don't necessarily mean the health crisis, although obviously that's going to have a huge impact on the way people think and behave, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also it's mainly about the, uh, the economic impact. And uh, that will definitely, uh, uh, sit above everything else for the next 12 months because regardless of which economist that you take your cues from most are going to uh, tell you that there's going to be a huge and steep and quite dramatic downturn in the economy and uh, that's obviously going to impact marketing it's obviously going to have an impact on demand generation uh, the way that we've been forced uh, to think and behave and live differently is obviously going to have an impact over the next few months. Uh, it doesn't mean that the job of marketing is there any different at all, because the job of marketing remains to understand and know your customer, whether or not uh, what we're going through right now is, to use that, one of those hoary old cliches of this time, unprecedented. Um, it doesn't mean that the job of understanding your customer and understanding their hopes, dreams and cues is any different. It just makes it a lot harder. And if you add the economic difficulty of people becoming more price sensitive and, uh, and the depressing of demand and all those things, the job of marketing is still the same. You just still, you've still got to make sure that you are serving uh, your customers at the, in the best possible way that you can. It's just, a bit harder with all of that stuff going on so that will definitely define the next 12 months absolutely i, I can sort of speak to this on a sort of semi-practical level which is that i think um even over these past 11 weeks then people who would have traditionally been very receptive to uh, a particular message you know that you know true that speaking in a personal situation here that we would have sent out and stuff like that um, even if that person would have been quote unquote, the perfect persona, the perfect, whatever it may be, their headspace would have been in a very different place to, um, what it might've been the day before or the day after. And I experienced this as highs and lows myself. Um, and that's, a, a nuance that has been built in through these times, you know, that, um, people's lives are very much in flux and changing and, and, mm you know building that sort of consistent quote unquote need uh feels different day to day for me um so if that need is different day to day then of course if you're reacting to your marketing your customers needs then you need to be mm -hmm. either strong enough in your convictions to continue and plow on um, because you feel like that's the right thing to do and people can engage when they want to or uh, you try to adjust to those needs but also be aware that um those things could change next week as well and, and you yeah. may need tactics in, in your tone and your communication over that time. Yeah, I mean, it should just make, I mean, if anything, it should make you a better marketer. You know, you have to pull on more tactical levers because you don't necessarily have the same budget to spend on promotion 
Uh, so you have to think about price and you have to think about product innovation. You have to think about all of those things that you might not have had to think about in different times. You have to be uh, close to your customer and understand them, uh, detach from them enough to be able to make an objective decision about what's right for them, but understand them at the same time. And, and that hasn't changed. I don't necessarily have any truck that things will, uh, with the opinion that things will permanently change. Uh, I think some stuff people will uh, behave differently around and uh, demand different things on you know we will perhaps shop a bit more online but we won't go from physical to digital uh, wholesale that's not what's going to happen we will work a bit more from home but mm. we won't all abandon the office mm. we will probably want to shop a bit more locally uh, but we won't exclusively wish to do so. So it's not going to change wholesale, but for a marketer in this time, uh, there is plenty more to think about. Uh, it doesn't make the job of marketing any different, but it does make it a bit more difficult. For sure. Absolutely. So uh, we'll close out on the question uh, from Jess, who's actually one of the founding 50 as well. Yes. Yes. Hello, Jess. <laughs> um, so she says, do you have any advice for anyone looking to get into the industry, uh, an aspiring writer, an aspiring journalist, and, and how they may go about doing that? Um, I think if I call back to my own experience, uh, as I said, I, um, I came to journalism quite late. I've done all sorts of things that wouldn't even warrant being called a career. I just earned money to do stuff. <laughs> Uh, and then quite late in my life, I think I was 30, I went back to journalism college. And um, what I did, because I was 30, I didn't have any time to dick around. I had to crack on. Mm. So what I did is I knocked on, uh, metaphorically speaking, as many doors as I possibly could to get as much experience as I possibly could in as short a space of time as, uh, as I thought I could afford. Um, so I just worked really bloody hard. <laughs> but it, uh, so that's one thing. It just get as much experience as you possibly can uh, to demonstrate, because it's hard to get into journalism. There aren't as many jobs and those jobs are a bit different to what they were. So you've got to demonstrate that you can do something that countless other journalists and graduates perhaps can't. And that is actual experience of doing the job. So do that. Uh, but also, I suppose it speaks to it in a way, uh, when you do get your foot in the door, um, understand the context of what you're doing. And again, work really hard to uh, to get up to speed with the industry or the uh, community that you're writing for, because that's the best way that you will ever, ever become a good reporter is understand your beat, understand your brief. What a way to end it. Thank you so much, Russell. I really appreciate uh, you taking the times so there was there was a lot of gold there so I'm really uh, grateful for that and and uh, grateful for everyone for the questions I have a uh, I've just taken a copy and paste of all the questions that have come in and uh, what I'll do is um, find a way for us to make sure that they get answered uh, whether that's our content marketing sorted for the next hundred weeks or uh, whether that's uh, something that Russell might be able to help with too uh, we may see um, all that is left to do is say thank you Russell for being here thank you for spending the time with us um thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight for spending the time um and you know of course please do thank the sponsors as well uh, we'll be sending out a, an event feedback form for the first time ever uh after this session tonight um so you know uh please do take the time to fill that in because that's the type of thing that will be really really useful and we'll also be announcing our second round of uh, webinar speakers coming up two uh with all that said um i need to do the brutal uh zoom close button of death uh which just cuts everything off to black uh in in just a moment but uh thanks russell for being here i really appreciate you taking the time thank you joe and thanks to everybody who um who watched and bothered to ask a question <laughs> nice one thanks everyone take care <laughs>